Gateway of the Mind is a well-known creepypasta. A bunch of mad scientists attempting some unbelievably literal interpretation of a figure of speech. This experiment was performed promptly after World War II ended, and seems to fit in with the long line of strange experiments performed by the Nazis during and or post-war. This is the basis for this page. The Nazi reign was famous for its backdoor scientists and occult researchers. Special expeditionary divisions of the Third Reich were often sent out in search of artifacts or locations of occult or religious significance. Meanwhile, in Germany, bunkers were assembled and mansions and castles were fitted with labyrinths and dungeons which were filled with strange experiments and research notes. Whenever the Allies found these places, they were often gutted, burned, or otherwise destroyed and abandoned. Whenever a lab was found intact, the research was often incoherent or missing, or later destroyed by the Allies to prevent the Nazis from recovering any hidden data. A lot of the Nazi experiments were kept under the radar until recently. Veterans who served as guards to the labs and ritual zones have explained what they have seen or folders and books have been uncovered in boxes and crates belonging to the scientists. A fair few of these contain a common research goal, giving man the power of God. Exactly the true power is often up to debate, but it appears that this is often described in Nazi research as immortality. Unable to die, invincibility, or other factors surrounding losing the capacity to die in some way or another. The larger part of this research was actually legitimately based. Certain doses of chemical compounds to aid blood flow in aging people. First concepts that are now used in today's transplant surgery. Grafting ointments that renewed skin antibodies to various diseases, and fitness dieting research. However, one set of crates discovered in Hamburg in 1999 went way off of this research style. This stuff crossbred the occult experiments and immortality research. Mind is a disease. The introductory folders and proofs of concept of the research begin with the principle that the brain controls the body completely and wholly, and as the body slowly degrades around it, it continues to function. Further statements say that the reason the body is left to degrade is because the human brain is set on a biological timer. Such is why butterflies can only live a day, yet other insects can often last longer. The brain tells us to die. It is proposed that the brain grows 
it begins to make connections resulting in the human becoming more mature and having an advanced brain. At the age of 35 to 50, however, these connections slowly break down, resulting in forgetfulness, dementia, and other mental diseases reserved for the elderly. Their Proposal The Nazi scientists proposed that the brain has a universal kill switch that activates as soon as the brain has fully developed. In all normal humans, this kill switch will initiate a shutdown sequence in bodily functions, which occurs over several decades. As soon as the body is fully shut down, the brain will be forced to die through lack of oxygenated blood. It is said that Werner's syndrome, a disease where a person ages rapidly, is a result of the kill switch function activating far too early. The Nazis proposed that they could remove the kill switch and give the human mind immortality and from that complete immortality. Needless to say, brain surgery was incredibly difficult during those times, but it was possible. In the stacks of folders, there were many different diagrams and past. Research on the brain, psychology, the human mind, and the like. The Location The experiments were initially proposed to Nazi executives in 1940, and permission was granted to perform the experiments in 1942 under one condition. The experiments must be conducted outside of Germany. The German populace must not see this experiment in any way, shape, or form. It was no surprise to the scientists that the executives were paranoid about public relations, but the idea of performing the research outside of the fatherland was foreign in itself. Most experiments were performed in bunkers or basements. Regardless, the scientists complied and were able to organize a setup with their ally, Japan. In late 1942, the research had begun. Here is where it gets strange. The research team had taken over a Japanese orphanage. The orphanage was in the hills, supposedly somewhere in Shinmang, an area nearby Hiroshima, carrying out the experiments. The scientists deduced that if they tried to take the usual test subjects, old or diseased, people with nothing left to live for, similar in the fashion to Gateway of the Mind, they would be playing with the variable of disease. Or more importantly, they would be experimenting on a brain that has already had an activated kill switch rendering it useless in the context of finding the solution. As a result, the scientists demanded that children, namely the orphans in the orphanage, which they deemed to again have nothing else to live for, would become test subjects. Their young brains eliminated any cause for concern of an already activated kill switch. To begin the experiments, the children went through numerous immunizations and intense psychological testing to ensure that they would prevent any defects and keep a general benchmark for their subjects. Next, they began with the older staff of the orphanage, put under anesthetic. The surgeons opened up their skulls to find a good cross-section of an adult brain and begin to find key differences between it and a child's brain. After gaining a model of both a child brain 
and an adult brain, the scientists deduced that the universal kill switch wasn't located in the brain, but in the cerebellum, located at the rear. The cerebellum commands all subconscious activity in the brain, which is understandable since it isn't a conscious action to set off the kill switch. Systematically, they took the tallest child in the orphanage and began to open her up. They were about to begin their first kill switch, sectomy. They had managed to open up the cerebellum and remove the part presumed to be the kill switch. However, upon closing the subject up, they found that she had expired. They assumed that the incisions on the brain had been too brash and required far more precision. The body was dumped in the forest behind the orphanage. Success, presumably. After imports of different tools and different techniques developed, the scientists were finally able to remove the kill switch and successfully revive the patients. In May 1943, they had taken one of the youngest girls in the orphanage and removed the kill switch. The only function she lost was the ability to sweat. After their assumed success, the scientists had celebrated, after which everyone went to sleep. The next morning, the girl did not wake up and was revealed to be comatose. After a while, she was revived successfully, and the kill switch sectomies continued. Continuation. The initial success gave the doctors a new state of mind, one of refreshment. They were able to continue their experiments with the ease of mind that the theory was proven. Well, so they assumed. Before the doctors continued their removal research, they commissioned several doctors in from Moscow who were trained in the practice of bodily revival, technically zombification. However, it relies on the principles of using electric shocks and artificial hearts to power the body back up. They stated the reason for this was that the original subject always became comatose or clinically dead whenever she went to sleep and then revived herself in the morning. She had no signs of this behavior before the experiment and despite the fact that she revived, the doctors did not want to risk a success turning into a failure. The Russian scientists were put to the task of bringing her back to life whenever she expired. After several days of this, the Nazis concluded that it was safe to continue. Project Venom Project Venom was a Russian experiment to create super soldiers from the theory of Dr. Frankenstein. It may also form a basis for the Marvel superhero as well. As a repayment for the use of the Russian scientists, Russia had asked that they combine the research of Project Venom with the Nazis' ongoing experiments. Naturally, the Nazis agreed. However, the limited number of orphans was debilitating, as the Nazis required so many of them and could only offer a single girl. The Russians were contempt and began their proof of concept. They had artificially created an arm over in Moscow which was on its way to the orphanage to be grafted on to prove that amputation and replacement could work. In the meantime the Russians had to prepare for this. The girl's right arm was amputated mysteriously shortly after the Russian scientists packed up their equipment and left. The replacement arm never came and the girl was left with a bandage strapped over her kimono. 
Perpetually, the Russians were said to have left a fearful haste, as if suddenly the air had turned to cold for their tastes. Rebellion. One child, out of the whole orphanage, did not approve of the scientist's presence. In her acts of rebellion, she stole paperwork and ripped it to shreds, broke glassware, and wrecked surgery theaters. Despite her young age, eight years old, and size, she had a surprising capacity for destruction. It was noted in a journal that she was heterochromic as well, brown and blue eyes from left to right. The senior scientist despised her, but could not restrain her without arousing suspicion. Instead, they ordered the Nazi soldiers to take care of her. She was brutally beheaded with a blunt bayonet. She was not buried, just left in the woods behind the orphanage. The soldiers told the caretakers that she had found a new family. Numerous Failures The Nazi scientists attempted to play around with their successful experiment by trying different aspects to it. Sadly, none of them worked. Here is a list of them. Entry through the forehead performed on a ten-year-old boy. Skull was deformed and the boy had been virtually lobotomized by the end of it. However, he wasn't vegetative as a result, although he was mentally retarded due to the experiment. Entry through the lower jaw performed on a six-year-old girl. The tongue and most of the flesh on the lower jaw was removed and could not be replaced. The subject's sinuses were also scrambled. Entry through the side of the head. Subject was reluctantly half-deaf. It should also be noted that there was no anesthetic during the surgery, and the screams were truly mortifying, as most journals read. Despite the failure of these, the kill switches were still removed and the subjects acted in much the same way as the first girl. Expiring upon sleep, however, they were reduced to a mere ten people due to all the previous failures. This is including the caretakers, and they had performed surgery on all the children. The Kill Switch Reversal the doctors began to formulate ideas that in a child a kill switch isn't already activated, but in an adult a kill switch could be reversed using a chemical compound to eliminate the hormone produced and the kill switch then removed. This was performed on all the caretakers and was surprisingly successful as they all survived. Personalities gone away. During the experiments, scientists were told to watch over the successful children and monitor their behavior. This part gets freaky. They appear normal at first, just like any of the other children playing, cheering, learning normally, but when separated from the others, they seem off. They stroll carelessly around with a blank smile on their face, their eyes looking straight at you. If approached from behind, their heads snap around with ungodly speed. And for a moment, you can almost see an expression so vile on their face that it makes you want to cower. But then you realize they are just forming their dreamy smile again. Another thing is that they follow us, but only when we are on our own. After finishing on my typewriter and heading to my room, I am often given a fright by one of the children standing several meters down the dark hallway, staring at me. When I go off to my room, she follows me, and I shut my door, jam a chair behind it, 
and then I sleep safely. It feels like there are ghosts at night time. And the funny thing is, I keep seeing one child with reddish hair. I keep asking who the child is the next morning, but the caretakers say they haven't had a child with reddish hair for a while. They also seem to be playing a game a lot more than when we started. I haven't got much knowledge of Japanese, but it seems the game is named Circle You. Circle You. As described by one of the translators, a group of children surround one child who sits in the center alone. They link arms and begin to move in a circular manner around the child, making scary faces at them and singing an eerie chant. You lose if you flinch. Upon talking to them, I've noticed they seem more dreamy, forgetful, and somewhat blank as if the experiments wiped their memories as well, but it's not an innocent type of dreamy, rather something more sinister. They stare at you with wide eyes and ask you questions never thought they would know. One asked, When your grandmother died, did she really leave you a gold-plated watch? It may seem crazy, but my honest answer was yes. Kagome, Kagome means circle, circle. The game translates to circle you, circle you. The child who rebelled against the scientists had reddish hair. In early 1945, Hiroshima is bombed, Germany forfeits, and the experiments are ground to a halt. The Germans begin packing up their equipment. Most of them have already returned home due to their mental welfare, stating that they showed signs of insanity. Only four scientists remained. After sending the last set of equipment off, the scientists deemed it only justified that they inform the caretakers that they were leaving, and they did so. And to the horror of one of the scientists, and the surprise of the rest, the head caretaker said in fluent German, Will you play one last game with us? The three scientists agreed, and a circle of children and caretakers formed around them. Now, if you flinch, you lose. The one horrified scientist ran to the last truck and jumped on it without looking back. The story now. If you go to Hiroshima, go around the woods, and you may find some dirt trails there. If you travel down them, you will see beautiful forests, but if you travel down one that has had signs of trucks going through, you will feel cold, and you will see that a lot of trees are cut down. But don't wander from the path, or you'll likely get lost in those vast woods. If you pay attention, you will notice that the tree stumps look like kneeling people missing heads. If you continue, the air will get cold, naturally because you're climbing uphill, right? Of course, eventually, you will reach a clearing with an old stone building in the center, vines covering the place. Go inside, if you want to play. As soon as you open the door, a foul smell will come out similar to that of a rotting corpse. If you look down the hall, it will be dark regardless of the time of day, since there are no lights. Continue down the hall, take the first left, and go down that hall until you see one door that appears to be made out of a red colored wood. The rest are brown. Open the door. You will find ten 
happy children, and caretakers, all wearing kimonos, playing in a normal playroom. One is missing her arm, another is missing his forehead, and a third lacks a jaw, but all are bandaged with clinical precision. The place should be very clean and tidy, dependent on your standard of such things, and well lit. At once, your presence will draw the attention of everyone in the room, including the ones that look far too preoccupied or distracted. They will turn to look at you, carefree smiles from each of their pleasant faces. The head caretaker, in an all her beauty, will ask, Will you come play with us? By this time, if you haven't soiled your pants, you really should, to save you the trouble later. If you say no, the door will slam shut on you, and if you try to go down the hallways, out the exit, you will only find another dark hallway open and any of the brown doors, and you should find operating tables or bunk beds. If you continue down the third hallway, you will realize that a girl is standing several meters behind you, her face shrouded by shadow. Approach it and expect your doom. Continue down the hallway and try not to let her catch up with you. If you say yes, however, you will be welcomed into the room. The door will close behind you and everyone will form a circle around you. Now, sit down and don't flinch, a cheerful voice will say. Just follow the instructions and you will survive. All light will disappear from the room, yet you can still see the circle of children, each with a vicious expression on their face. One so vile you will probably flinch straight up. If you can stomach that though, they will begin to move around and around you, slowly. You may feel one of them lash towards you. If you look, however, there will be nothing there besides the children circling normally. If that wasn't enough, they will begin chanting, Kagome, Kagome. I really can't explain any further. No one ever lives to tell the tale of what happens then. If you flinch before they chant, they simply continue as normal. If you choose to say maybe to the head caretaker or anything other than yes or no, it is told that the children's expressions will turn mortifying, zeljonic, almost. And they will scream in inhuman voices, DECIDE! DECIDE! If you do anything besides say yes or no from here, it is told that the children and caretakers will slam the door on you. If you turn around, the story varies. Supposedly, your worst fear will be waiting at the other end of the hallway, separating you from your exit. Most notably, this character is Akamanto, or the Rake. The least you could do is greet the Creator before he tears you onto oblivion. If he has the capacity, he may well respond, and you will die as a polite person. Don't greet him, and you will end up as another one of the beheaded bodies along the trail. If you respond, I don't understand, and you must be genuine, the head caretaker will say, go to your school and watch your children play. You should understand then. Nothing will have changed and close the door on your way out. It's common courtesy.
Most creepypastas are fabricated, some derived from psychological stigma, and others are revamped ghost stories. But there is a small percentage of creepypastas which aren't like this. These are the true creepypastas. And that's not to say that they are a higher class of original pastas, which spawn forth others. It just means they're real. Germany did send a research team to Japan to experiment immortality via the brain. And they did experiment on children in an orphanage. If you enjoyed this and would like to hear more stories like these, please go to www.youtube.com slash the voice of nightmares. While you're there checking out all my fantastic videos, don't forget to hit the little subscribe button, then hit the notification bell just so you know whenever I upload. Also, you can follow me on social media sites such as Twitter, Instagram, Amino, Mr. Creepypasta Amino, Creepypasta Amino, and last but not least, coming in 2019, my very own website called thevoiceofnightmares.com. Also, all art, music, and stories are owned by the respected authors. As always, links are available in the description below.